before I jump into the agenda for today, I'd like to invite Regina from SV at Home to share a welcoming message. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for giving me a moment to say welcome. I'm so excited to be with you all today and to see you all in this space. I just wanna say that um, I am Regina Sleston Williams. I'm the executive director of SV at Home, and we have the pleasure of being able to host Affordable Housing Month in the month of May. This year's theme for Affordable Housing Month is building community, which is reinforcing our relationships with the people, neighborhoods, and local partners committed to making housing justice a reality. So at SV at Home, we recognize that every supporter of Affordable Housing Month plays a critical role in shaping our communities so that they are diverse, affordable, equitable, and accessible for all. Um, we really try to emphasize with this year's theme, the need for all of us to deepen our commitment to this work and lay the building box of a future that we can only construct together. So um, it's good to be here with you later in this month of May. There are still many more affordable housing uh, events. So please check out our website and our affordable housing month calendar. And thank you again to Lyft and um, build Build Up California. I'll turn it back over to you, Pamela. Thank you, Regina. I really appreciate that welcoming message and letting us know a little bit about Affordable Housing Month. Um, we've got a really great mix of panelists today joining us from Board of Supervisors President Susan Ellenberg to Lyft's Director of Advisory um, Policy and Partnerships in Early Care and Education. Uh, Shelly Maser, and then Lyft's Deputy Director of Lending in Northern California, Stephen Yang. So on the agenda today, Supervisor Ellen Berg will be starting us off with why she advocated to set aside funding for ECE facilities and how ECE facilities are related to housing. Next, we will hear from Shelly, who will dive deeper into what we mean when we say co-locating housing and child care. And to close out Lyft's presentation, Stephen Yang will share his experience as a lending partner working with ECE and the financing structures, as well as potential barriers that arise in this partnership. So I am sure that we're all buzzing with eagerness to get this panel started. I know I am. But first, I quickly um, want to share about the organizations who are behind today's webinar, like Regina mentioned, Lyft and Build Up California. Um, and just all the collaboration along with SV at Home that successfully brought, how many people are we at right now? Um, 39 people in a room on a Thursday evening to talk about childcare and housing. That is very exciting. So um, LIF is a nonprofit community development financial institution that mobilizes capital and partnerships to advance our goals of social justice and racial equity. And we focused for several decades in the space of lending to affordable housing developers and more recently have been expanding our work in ECE facilities, um, lending and, and grants as well. And the role that I um, get to have at Build Up Cal at LIF is with Build Up California, which is a network of advocates from diverse sectors who champion public investment in ECE facilities infrastructure across the state of California. And now Regina mentioned earlier that we're in Affordable Housing Month, it's May, and this is a time where community comes together in the collaborative spirit of affordable housing. It's a time when housing advocates collaborate with cross-sector allies, partners, policymakers, and various community groups to discuss best practices and innovative solutions to addressing our housing crisis. SV at Home has been a great builder of community spaces for folks to gather and think creatively, which is what we need if we're going to make holistic and robust housing justice a reality. So today we hope that the conversation inspires action, inspires community building, and connection. Um, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Supervisor Ellen Berg, um, and a quick bio uh, introduction for her. So Supervisor Susan Ellen Berg, represents a diverse population of just under 400,000 residents in Santa Clara County District 4, which includes the unincorporated community of Burbank, much of West San Jose, and the cities of Campbell and Santa Clara. 
Supervisor Ellen Berg serves as president of the Board of Supervisors, as well as the chair of the county's Public Safety and Justice Committee and the vice chair of the Finance and Government Operations Committee. She's a member of the California State Association of Counties Executive Committee and a board member of First Five Santa Clara County. Supervisor Ellen Berg is also a former trustee for San Jose Unified School District. And Susan, uh, Supervisor Ellen Berg, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Pamela, uh, for the introduction. Thank you to Shelley and the Low Income Investment Fund for uh, assembling this panel and inviting me to participate. And of course, to uh, Regina Williams and Silicon Valley at Home for sponsoring Affordable Housing Month. Since joining the Board of Supervisors in uh, January 2019, I've been focused on building pathways for greater access to childcare. Why? <laughs> because broad access to affordable, high quality childcare boosts the employable population, increases employer productivity, expands consumer spending, reduces rates of poverty and housing instability, uh, creates safer neighborhoods, and almost by the way, it's great for children's development and early learning, a significant indicator for later successful performance in school. At the county, my very first proposal to our administration was to provide sliding scale childcare subsidies to our own county employees. But let me just say at the outset that I do not believe that employer funded childcare is the end goal. Employer funded childcare is absolutely better than the absence of childcare, but it is inequitably accessed. It's, in, it's inherently unstable because people change jobs. It can create mission creep and expanded liability for employees. Uh, more on that in a little bit. Uh, also in my first year as a member of the Board of Supervisors, I directed the creation of a reserve fund of $3 million for our county fleet and facilities department to invest in county owned facilities, which could accommodate childcare spaces, uh, child care spaces for greater access by both our own workforce and surrounding community members. Access to childcare prior to the pandemic was limited, inequitable and expensive. We didn't have enough slots for families that were holding state funded vouchers. We didn't have enough facilities, even for families who could afford to pay, pay for the slot. And we didn't have a sufficient workforce in no small part because wages and reimbursements, reimbursement rates are abysmally low. Then during the pandemic, more than 300 childcare providers across Santa Clara County closed their doors. An even greater lack of available, of available workers are cha challenging plans to reopen and cost of operating facilities have grown significantly. So in what will be a surprise to exactly nobody, San Mateo and Santa Clara County are considered high cost counties. In this case, regarding childcare access, it is expensive to build, it's expensive to, for parents to pay for slots, and it's expensive for providers to operate. Even the state subsidy cap, which is higher, in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties than in most other counties in the state. It excludes huge swaths of families who are supposedly middle-class, but would be compelled to spend more than 40% of their incomes on childcare because they don't qualify for subsidies. Our counties are comprised of densely populated cities that have limited availability of land for early childhood education facility development. The average cost of development for sure varies by type of construction, but 2017 estimates ranged from $25,412 unit, $12 to $53,800 per child space. And again, 2017 data prior to today's inflation and prior to the pandemic induced uh, inventory reduction. A 2017 study by the Santa Clara County Office of Education estimated the cost of a single portable building with the capacity to serve 24 children at $609,000. Here's just a little bit more math. If 
60% of our unmet need for preschool, and that unmet need is estimated to be almost 3,800 children, is met by, so 60% met by new portable buildings, 20% by new buildings, and 20% through expansion of existing centers, the total estimated cost for development of a sufficient supply of early learning facilities is about $117 million. So to that end, um, and, and with my, my advocacy, the Board of Supervisors allocated $15 million in ARPA recovery funds for a childcare and early education infrastructure grant program to rebuild the economy. The intent here is to assist early learning and child care providers to reopen or expand their services in Santa Clara County. We know from subject matter experts what's needed to build access to child care is not only the infrastructure, but the workforce and, and of course, dependable funding systems. When we solve for this challenge, literally every sector of a community benefits, and this, this is not hyperbole. A phrase that uh, those of you who know me have heard me say before, and undoubtedly you will all hear me say again, is this. Child care serves a public good and it should be funded as such. It is anti-poverty, economy boosting, and family stabilizing. This was a topic, by the way, that came up again and again in joint, in joint venture Silicon Valley's State of the Valley event a few months ago, where the annual Silicon Valley Index was released through a presentation that put real numbers behind some of the significant pressures under which too many of our residents struggle. One data set showed that 72% of all adults in the Bay Area consider the cost of living to be a, quote, extremely serious problem, but that 72% jumps to 83% when you only ask parents with children under five years old. And in that group, 95% believe that the cost of living is a serious problem and a strong majority name unaffordable childcare as a major factor in that seriousness. And right now, unfortunately, one of the few ways to deal with that challenge is to leave the region. We just finished a once in a decade redistricting process and the population of each Santa Clara County district, uh, supervisorial district, decreased from about 400,000 residents to about 370,000. This drop in population will obviously not reverse itself on its own. And a community can't survive if people can't start and raise families here. And the issue isn't just affordability, but availability. For example, in the city of Gilroy, more than one in 20 young children qualify for fully subsidized care, and they have those vouchers literally in, in hand, but they can't use them because there are no available spots. That's because we are, we are facing a critical shortage of facilities and a shortage of providers. A simple sounding goal of mine is to make Santa Clara County the best place in California to raise a family, with all respect to San Mateo County. Um, welcome welcome some friendly competition and we can be one and two. One of the building blocks for success, and this is something that cities should absolutely have a deep interest in, is that we shift the narrative around childcare and build a deep understanding that local economies are suppressed. There is less consumer spending, lower professional productivity, and greater poverty, all of which lead to a host of socioeconomic challenges when high quality affordable childcare isn't available. Childcare facilities are small businesses that pay taxes and attract families to our cities, keeping residents employed and increasing local consumer spending. This brings me to why I am here today during Affordable Housing Month. Housing and childcare are the sources of highest cost for residents. And like housing, Child care needs to be an all-in partnership effort with cities, counties, local school districts, private organizations, and housing developers. Child care is an effort which includes permitting, site approval, licensing, economic development, workforce growth, and quality of life. I am so eager to partner with all of the developers who are on this, on this call uh, to bring this sector to scale. Early investments pay off 
in every conceivable direction. And quality publicly funded childcare is one of those investments that pays off in the immediate, mid and long term. Right now I'm co-chairing with Maria Noel Fernandez, who's the executive director of Working Partnerships USA, an effort called Build the Future, which is a year long program of education, advocacy and organizing to shift that conversation around childcare and to build significant public and private support for the notion that childcare is the root of economic stability and that entire communities benefit from this investment. Um, for more information on that, I encourage you to email info, I-N-F-O, at buildthefuturescc.org. And I think one of my team members can pop that email in the chat for me. But back again to that $15 million in, uh, 15 million in ARPA dollars that the board approved to go towards infrastructure. These funds can be used to renovate, upgrade, or expand current facilities or seed new facilities and services. The RFP is being developed by county administration and providers and local, and it's being developed by county administration and, lo, and providers and local government entities will be eligible to receive funding. So I would urge, again, the developers and other folks here to look at your facilities and see where you might have space for childcare. Think both about the current and future residents for whom you're building and about the need in the surrounding community. You can partner with licensed or licensed exempt providers to actually operate the program. And the county can help with needs assessment and startup costs. Everyone can be a part of this. This permitted use of ARPA funds validates that child care is infrastructure, but we can't stop there. The narrative around childcare has to keep shifting. The conversations we have will have impact and we need to hold everyone, including myself, accountable to deliver. Let me just close my remarks with a reminder that the County of Santa Clara is your partner. We share common goals around solving for the gaps that leave residents on our streets or preventing families from leaving our region. There is no shortage of ways for us to work together on behalf of all residents. I thank those of you who are partners uh, with us already and encourage the rest of you to please reach out to my office or reach out to our Office of Children and Families Policy, which will be administering the child care grant. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions and more conversation. Thank you so much, Supervisor Ellenberg, for that remarkable. Um, you know, introduction to this conversation, I really resonate with so much that you said, and just a, a personal tangent about me and my life and how that, that deeply affects me and, and my family's ability to stay here in the region. I'm just thinking about how many friends have left San Jose to move to Morgan Hill, Gilroy, Oregon, to raise their families and how hard that is on, you know, community members to have to travel so far to stay in touch with their loved ones. So I'm very excited about this opportunity for our community in Santa Clara County, for our extended Silicon Valley community in the Bay Area to collaborate on these partnerships because they are so critical. And I just want to focus in on, on one thing that Supervisor Ellenberg said and um, thinking about where you fit in as a part of the solution because we all have a role to play. And so um, just, just hold that for a moment and we are going to introduce our next panelist, my uh, colleague, Shelly Maser, who is LIFT's Director of Advisory Policy and Partnerships in Early Care and Education. She has led nonprofit organizations locally and statewide in California and has dedicated her career to focusing on education and health with a commitment to coalition building, advocacy, and systems change. Shelley is a former elected official. In 2015, she was elected to Redwood City Council and served as vice mayor in 2019 during her final year. Her council service was preceded by 10 years as an elected school board member. So please, Shelley, um, applause and, and welcome. Thanks, Pamela. And thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. I think we can all be grateful 
um, for the day you were first elected and for your reelection. Um, just hearing your passion and your commitment and all the work that you've already done to advance childcare is um, inspiring, I think, for all of us. So, um, and it's a perfect intro to um, how we at Lyft think about increasing access to childcare. So, as you heard, we we focus on um, childcare facilities, and we really see that as building the supply of childcare across the state. We look at Supervisor Ellenberg talked about the workforce. We look at two kinds of infrastructure. There's the people infrastructure, the people who actually deliver the, the child care. And then there's the physical infrastructure, the buildings that, that they work in. And both need to be there in order for families and children to have access. I think the other thing that I was thinking about is Regina's great introduction and the theme of this month's affordable housing, a building community and constructing together uh, could not be a more perfect theme for our discussion around co-locating childcare with affordable housing. And maybe Esmeralda, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, that would be great. There we go. So I'm just gonna sort of set the stage a little bit. Some of this will be a little bit of repeat, but it's a little bit of a different context. We know that for young children, the environments they live, learn and play in, are critical for their for their development. They need safe uh, childcare that's high quality. They need neighborhoods that are safe for them to be in. They need clean air and safe streets. And so when we think about all of that at Lyft, we think about chi building child-centered communities that really look at um, impacting historic exclusionary policies. And we know that just, we look at housing and childcare through the same lens of these we say the four A's. Um, so you can see on the slide, we talk about affordable, adequate, available, and accessible. So I just have a couple of stats here for you. Um, in Santa Clara County, some of you probably already know this, but renters need to earn more than three times the minimum wage just to afford the average rent, which is kind of staggering if you think, <laughs> if you think about it. And then um, Supervisor Ellenberg talked about the cost of childcare but I just want you to take a look at this number at the bottom. One year of care for an infant is more than $26,000 a year. Now, mo many people pay more than their rent in childcare. And so that economic stability piece that, that we've heard about already is really critically, these two are critically linked. So that's the affordability piece. Adequate, that is the quality of the space that people are living in or working in. And we know this money that um, Santa Clara County has set aside is gonna be really critical for providers who either need to do major or minor upgrades to their space to ensure that it's safe and healthy for the people who work there and for the children who, who are cared for there. Just one note, in addition to the numbers that Supervisor Ellenberg put out, across the US, fixing, fixing all residential deficiencies would cost over $126 billion. And we saw this right here in our own community. The climate change is worsening the problem of being able to maintain our homes. As we experienced floods, high wind, significant rains this past winter, we know that people's homes were significantly affected. And that includes people working out of their homes and running family childcare homes. Additionally, we need availability. Um, I will, we, it's in the news every day, how much housing we need to build across this region and across the state. Um, these are Santa Clara County's uh, regional housing needs numbers. And then Supervisor Ellenberg talked about accessibility. Over 67% of families in Santa Clara County lack access to a licensed child care slot. And then the last thing I'll talk about is the accessibility piece. So, when we think about how builders build, and as a council member, we talked about this a lot, when we got um, projects in front of us, often they were studios and one bedrooms. They weren't, um, they weren't units that families could live in. So we really encouraged um, building two and three bedroom units for families that they could afford. And we also don't think about the perspectives of young children when we're thinking about design. And so, I would encourage you as you walk around wherever you live or work to look around and think about it. If you were a little, just a little tiny person trying to navigate your way through there, how could you get uh, through the streets uh, on transportation? 
Um, obviously, you'd be with an adult, but what would it be like to walk through those spaces? And that's how we're really trying to think about things at Lyft. Esmeralda, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. So here's the ways we think about the importance of co-locating affordable housing and childcare. We can respond to multiple issues at the same time. And most uh, recently, LIF has really started having a focus on climate. Um, we, are, we are engaged in many efforts across the country around uh, addressing climate change, um, building the, um, re sorry, responding to the impacts of climate change for providers and in our affordable housing. We've been looking at federal dollars, state dollars, so that we can understand and help child care providers as well as housing developers address these impacts. And when we put together housing and child care, we can do a lot of things at once to address the impacts of climate change because we're doing multiple things, including making it possible for people to get out of their cars and not drive their kids to child care. And you can see this map over here. On the right hand side is just an example of what happens in urban in uh, sprawling areas where we have lower density, um, the impacts of climate change increase. So one more slide I think for me, please. Just wanna share with you a couple of ways we think about uh, co-location and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Stephen, who will go into a little bit of a deeper dive on this. But there's two ways that we can address co-locating. A lot of times people think about, you can only have childcare centers. And that is one way to do it. And it is much, it's more common, um, but you build new construction of uh, multifamily housing, you build in a childcare center into that, and that's great. Or you can do it on an existing space where you, um, maybe you're uh, renovating or preserving affordable housing and you have an existing community space that could be renovated into childcare space. That is, that is a, a really good approach. It serves more kids and it can serve the community. But another way that is also often more cost-effective for, um, for some developers is to partner with family childcare homes. You can build units so that they are intentionally designed, um, income affordable um, for providers to live, and you can work with tenants and support them through a variety of different pieces of forming a family child care home, including providing licensing support, helping them think about business. Um, there's lots of resources that are available that um, LIF often connects people with, and many of our partners who are affordable housing developers do that as well. Um, it is both an income stability um, Piece for the tenants and it makes child care accessible for the new residents of, the, of those um, affordable housing developments. So I'm going to leave it at that for the moment and I'm going to turn it over to Stephen and let him talk a little bit more. Ready, Stephen? Thanks, Shelly. Before we turn it over to Stephen, I just want to introduce him real quick. I do have a quick bio and and a couple of points that I just want to resonate um, or that resonated with me on what Shelly was mentioning. And I saw it in the chat, the need to expand this work outside of Santa Clara County, because it's true throughout the state of California and throughout the country, we need to be doing more to improve uh, access to early care and education facilities and also affordable housing for our young children and families. Don't know how many of you all saw the headline in the news last week. LA Times reported that one in four childcare facilities tested as having dangerously high levels of lead. And we know that there's no healthy level of lead exposure for young and developing children. So the urgency is there. Um, and, and yeah, we, we will continue this conversation with my colleague, Stephen Yang, who is LIS Deputy Director of Northern California. He is an accomplished industry professional with experience in lending, financial planning, forecasting, and risk analysis in both for-profit and nonprofit sectors. As a team leader, Stephen works as an effective cross-functional partner who is involved as a social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion advocate. So please, Stephen, uh, we welcome you to continue the conversation. Great, thank you for that. And it's good to be in conversation with you all this afternoon. And I want to say thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for all your leadership and Shelley for all the context and background on how affordable housing and early care and education are 
indeed intertwined and where the intersection of these two issues paint a clear picture for a need uh, for deliberate and coordinate effort to leverage resources and expertise of both sectors for a truly win-win situation where communities can really thrive. You know, as mentioned, I'm on the lending team at Lyft co covering the Northern California market with a focus on growing Lyft's impact in three key areas, impact-led lending, affordable housing, and early care and education. And how we do this is by offering a variety of financial products that include acquisition and pre-development loans, construction and term loans for affordable housing, early care education, and community facilities, both through our revolving loan fund and other funding programs that we help administer, such as the Golden State Acquisition Fund, and our collaboration with other CDFIs and other public-private partnerships. In the short amount of time we have together uh, this afternoon, I'll be highlighting some considerations to sort out early in the process, available financing options, and potential challenges. We're aware that each project and partnership are unique, and I welcome you to follow up with me if you have a project you'd like to explore further, or questions you may have via email, and we can set up a time to do a deeper dive or get you connected with the right individuals. So to start, when we're talking about forming a partnership for the co-location of housing and childcare, if it's done well, both developers and operators benefit. The child care program gets access to a high quality, often affordable space in a community with significant need. And the developer has a long-term committed partner that provides a public service to residents in the surrounding communities. Now the key to a successful partnership is early and often transparent conversations to evaluate both mission alignment and setting clear expectations on the onset. You know, it's very important to understand the landscape and community needs, right? What are the targeted service populations? What is the operator's program history and track record? What are the secured funding streams, such as proof of any state or federal contracts to support operation and enrollment of low-income children? All of this will be important in analyzing the pro formas or cash flow projections for the new space and financial feasibility of the business plan. Uh, ideally, there would be a memorandum of understanding MOU in place that establishes the structure and framework for the partnership that covers the elements that are outlined here in the green box. Having this framework, it's going to help move the project forward uh, in uh, identifying what funding sources would work to advance the project through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, LIHTC, and varying notice of funding availability, NOFA application rounds that do become available. An important consideration that may be unique to co-location is the collaborative approach toward the selection of architects, the GC, consultants for the build out at the childcare facility to be sure that we ensure design requirements and planning. And if we could go to the next slide. You know, another consideration for co-located projects really involves the financing and legal structures. Uh, which are highlighted here. For those projects located in qualified census tracts, these are certain areas of concentrated poverty that are designated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, these projects are eligible for a 30% basis boost, where this bonus in the construction subsidy can be used to develop a community facility. Now, the right financial consultants and your tax attorneys can advise on the various nuances of the eligibility compliance risk, mass release requirements, et cetera. But the, the key takeaway here is that the inclusion of childcare centers in LIHTC projects as a community facility is estimated to cover roughly 60 and 90% of the development costs of the facility. The second uh, scenario is a commercial lease situation. And this is where they understand the project goals, right? The population served and having the right operator who will be the lessee outlining who's responsible for the fit out, all of that, it's going to be very important in understanding the financing need and help the lender uh, during the underwriting uh, to get comfortable with available cash flow for servicing of any debt. And lastly, uh, developing the child care center as a condo can offer added flexibility for the developer over the lifespan of the building, but this does require additional planning up front. Um, this could potentially help with collateral considerations where the early care education facility 
would be um, funded outside of the affordable housing component. And if we could go to the next slide. Once you have the partnership and legal structure framework in place, that's when we can really start looking at what financing sources are available that best match the project's needs and goals. Uh, some examples are listed here, but I'll just quickly highlight that LIF, in addition to our affordable housing loans, we also have an early care education construction and term loan product, including a special purpose uh, credit program designated to finance facilities for early care education programs that are led by Black women. I'm happy to connect you with the loan officer managing that program and talk more about any specific project needs uh, further offline. But I did just wanna quickly share a very impactful project. It's outside of Santa Clara County, it's in San Francisco, um, led by Mercy Housing in the Sunnydale, Sunnydale District, where Liv had the privilege of being able to play uh, a part in supporting the overall development. Under Mercy's leadership and partnership with the city and many other partners, Mercy broke ground on this community development that ultimately will provide 1,000 units of affordable housing, 700 units of workforce housing, combining the housing with the development of a community center creating uh, childcare, recreation, youth and green space, along with other neighborhood amenities. This project is really an example of the holistic community development utilizing public-private partnerships to really leverage the resources that are available and the expertise for the benefit of the whole neighborhood. And if we go, can go to the next slide, you know, I'll, I'll just end with acknowledging that co-locating housing and early care education, it does have its challenges. And times there are misalignment in poly, policy incentives. And I, you know, with that, I think I'll pass it back to Shelley and Supervisor Ellenberg, who lead us in that conversation, um, how, um, you know, what bar potential barriers are and, you know, what type of solutions are out there. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Shelley, did you want to chime in? Yes, if I can get myself off mute. <laughs> um, yeah, and Supervisor, if you want to chime in as well, I think the thing that you and I have both talked about is the challenge of operating in a variety of, especially for those of us in the in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, we're operating amongst a variety of different cities with diff different zoning regulations, different fee regulations. There's a whole mix of policies that impact uh, people's ability to to both build and renovate in our communities. And so I think that's one piece that um, that Stephen was talking about, but uh, Supervisor, what, what are your thoughts? So something that would be really interesting to me, uh, Shelley, and thank you so much, Stephen, for, for really a lot of the, the very tactical uh, issues and considerations that don't often filter up to the policy level. But I think that one way to bring them together might actually be to create um, a document that, that details some of these, these barriers and put it in the form almost of, of, a, of a resolution that each of our cities could pass um, to create some kind of continuity, at least agreement around streamlining permitting what expectations can look like. D different cities, of course, have different capacities, but I think we could unify around some principles of prioritization. And again, I'm, I'm coming to the cities because childcare and housing are so integrally connected to economic development and, and the health of cities. Uh, and, yeah. And, that would be that that's not a problem solver in itself, but it's a way of raising the issues consistently across one or two two counties. I mean, we, we could be doing this Bay Area wide as well. Um, that that shows cities how they can help streamline this work, whether they are building affordable housing or or trying to do some of this work independently. Of course, they all better be building affordable housing. Yeah. <laughs> But, but it right. could apply in in different in different settings. Yeah, and I think it's a 
it's a great point. And I think one of the things that um, Build Up San Mateo County did, and I saw Christine on this webinar, I'm not sure if she was able to stay on for the whole time, but Build Up San Mateo did this. And we at LIF, my colleague Andrea is here, are doing this in Riverside County, which is surveying all of the cities around a set of policies that um, can facilitate the growth of childcare um, if they're put in place. Some of them are just complying with state law um, that allows family childcare in residential neighborhoods by right. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we know those answers, and this is the example that Build Up San Mateo set for us, we can put them in that sort of single document with some check marks and cities can see sort of where do they stand, where are they aligned, where might they improve. And I can tell you, that I was a council member when Build Up San Mateo did it. And when we saw that, we were like, ooh, that other city's doing this, we better better get moving <laughs> and, try and, and try and align our policies in a way that um, facilitates the increase of childcare. So there's sort of like a, a, a way to um, build a little bit of awareness about what your other cities are doing, but then also build awareness about what you can actually do as a city and a policymaker and staff to actually facilitate the increase for um, for childcare facilities, right? I, I think those are those are really good good points. So, Pamela, I think we have a few questions in the chat. Um, some of them can be maybe we could answer a couple of those questions. Yeah, I, uh, the first question I want to address was regarding the slides and whether they will be shared, which they will um, via Eventbrite as a follow up to this um, conversation, we'll, we'll send those links and then once the video is ready, we'll send that as well to you all who registered via Eventbrite. Um, I see one other question and it asks whether priority is given to agencies and nonprofits. I believe that was regarding the 15 million um, allocated in the Santa Clara County budget. Is, is that an answer that we have? Um, I, I don't know that we have established a priority order based on entity, whether it's a nonprofit or, or a governmental entity. There's going to be a series of of eligibility uh, requirements, which frankly, we are working to make as broad as possible uh, to even be able to include some operating uh, funds because we are very interested not only in getting these dollars out the door as quickly as possible um, because they are ARPA dollars, uh, but also because the, the need is so urgent right now. So as soon as that RFP is is completed, certainly my office and, and I'm sure all of the the county will will broadcast and and blast this out uh, widely. And I see Hillary Armstrong here on the um, on the Zoom from our office of Children and Families Policy, and and I'm sure taking note of what San Mateo did around looking at um, those type of assessments that Shelley that Shelly mentioned. And, you know, it's not so much competition, but, you know, taking best practices from each other and seeing how we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we can lift each other's experiences up and, and build on those. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of best practices and wanting to learn from what others have been doing, uh, I want to elevate Liz Scully's comment. She asks where she can find more information about Mercy Housing's MOU in relation to the units set aside for FCC programs. Uh, sure. So I, I just want to point out that this particular transaction was a new markets um, tax credit deal and lifts early care education, you know, was administering a separate grant to the ECE provider and it's outside um, this pro the FCC program that we're talking about in Santa Clara County. Yeah, one of the interesting pieces of that program uh, to me, Stephen, are the the um, the rendering that you showed us is knowing that those required outdoor spaces for childcare can be part of the developer's required um, 
contribution to public spaces because they are for, for qualified child care providers. And that should be uh, appealing also. Ultimately, certainly our developers want to serve the community, but need to do so in a way that is financially uh, viable for, for them to do. And this is why I come back to this notion of public good, because ultimately there isn't going to be enough private funding dedicated in an ongoing way. We, we don't expect the private sector or even a public-private um, partnership to fund our K-12 education system or to fund our libraries or other things that we acknowledge to be public good. And child care for, you know, really for so long, other than that brief period during World War II when men were at war and companies needed women to go to work. So what do you know? We quickly had uh, access to universal child care, which then promptly ended when the, the men came back so that the the women essentially were forced to leave those new positions. So there, there is a precedent for this and for understanding the, the economic basis, but that's why I keep um, coming back to this narrative shift because until we recognize childcare as a responsibility far greater and broader than an individual parent, we're not gonna see the level of funding, ongoing funding um, that we need. I, I can envision a world where we actually scrape together $120 million to build out facilities, but that's not operational. That's not ongoing uh, wages. That's not continued development of a workforce. That doesn't necessarily mean it's affordable to parents. So we're going to, at some point, need a public revenue stream for this to really happen at scale. Yeah, and I would just point out, I mean, I completely agree with you, as you know, <laughs> but I, I would just point out that, um, you know, that Ready Nation just uh, released updated numbers from a study they had done in 2019 and found that the lack of access for childcare just for zero to three mm -hmm. is a cost to this country of $122 billion. That's in lost wages, lost tax revenue, and and um, lost business revenue. So if we just put that into context, and if you only wanna think about economic good as opposed to all of the other reasons you've pointed out, just that alone should have us going like, okay, we need to do something about this because we're losing people from the workforce, we're losing actual dollars in our tax revenues every day by not providing access to childcare. And, and that's precisely the point, because for decades, we've been talking about the value to children and to their immediate families, and, and we truly haven't really moved the, the needle. And the, the ultimate goal really is to have people that don't have children, that don't like children, understand that this is economic vitality for the entire uh, community. So I, I think that that's... Um, that's how we how we make progress. And what's interesting to me now is that I think this is a moment for the business sector to really be thinking differently about childcare as well. Because mm -hmm. I alluded to this at the very beginning of of my remarks, but um, a really pretty revolutionary thing that uh, President Biden did was build in a requirement for providing childcare through the CHIPS Act for semiconductor manufacturers. If they want these federal grants, they're going to need to provide childcare. So one, of course, I worry that if they only provide a subsidy and the facilities and the workforce isn't there, they haven't actually provided childcare. But secondarily, if businesses are concerned that there are gonna be more and more mandates for them to do this, would it possibly be more in their interest to support either you know, purely public revenue or public private funds to handle that child care for them so that they are not having to you know, put that work and have that additional liability and space issues and inconstancy with when you have more families with, with children and when you have fewer. So for the business community and the housing development community and the city's economic development communities to be talking about this right now, I, I think is, is absolutely a, a critical juncture. 
Yeah, and actually, just to the point of co-locating childcare and housing, the CHIPS Act also requires consideration of access to affordable housing as they're building new um, chip manufacturing facilities. Um, so I wanted to just, I noticed there's a couple of other things. I wanted to see if we could quickly address them in the chat. And uh, many thanks, Liz and Omar, for your active engagement in this discussion. Um, Liz, you asked a question about the income eligibility requirement and whether that would keep a family child care provider from increasing their income. Um, it, there is actually, uh, they are actually protected um, in that way. And we can talk more sort of offline if you want to learn more of the details about that. And then, um, and then Omar, you asked about out, rooftop outdoor playgrounds. Um, I do think that's a challenge in um, cities outside of San Francisco and San Diego. So I think it's a potential uh, advocacy opportunity um, as we're looking at building more uh, multifamily housing with childcare co-located there. Um, and then let's see what else. And then Denitra, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I apologize if I'm not. Um, you asked about for-profit uh, operators. For-profit operators um, could fit in in a variety of ways. It just depends on how um, a developer and a, and a provider decide to structure a partnership, but it, it is possible. And it's one of the things in Riverside County we're looking at to connect existing providers with new housing developers. Um, and figuring out how they might operate, how they might partner together as new housing is being built in, in Riverside County. Um, and the funds can go to the provider. The public funds are, are not going to be able to go to the, the for-profit developer, but if the for-profit developer is offering space and our fund, and, and I can't speak for yours, Shelley, is working with the provider, there are still really excellent opportunities for um, for access to public funds. Yeah. And then the last thing is Stephen, Mitch Slagerman wants to connect with you. So I hope, hope you saw that. When you get our slide deck, you'll have both my email address and Stephen's email address. So please feel free to reach out to us. And um, with that, I think uh, Pamela, I'm gonna, oh, Esmeralda just put in a link to the survey. We'd love it if you could fill that out. And Pamela, I'm gonna let you close us out. Thank you, Shelley. Um, yes, please, please, please fill out that survey that Esmeralda just dropped in the chat. You can do it while I'm talking. We'll play some music to close us out as well. So you can work on that um, in these last couple of minutes. But I just wanna thank you all for being with us while we had a very insightful conversation. Um, my goal was to ensure that we've all got a better understanding of what it means to co-locate childcare and affordable housing. So to recap, Today's conversation was centered on one of the most promising interventions for simultaneously addressing the housing and childcare crisis. What we call co-location, AKA including space for childcare facilities on site at housing developments has proven to be an effective way of allowing parents to fully participate in the workforce. And we know that when we co-locate, or I'm sorry, when we locate childcare facilities closer to residential developments, it helps communities meet planning and climate goals by reducing commute times and increasing opportunities for residents to walk, bike, or take public transit rather than private vehicles to take their children to childcare. So as we engage in this work, uh, we can be mindful and we can reflect on the fact that cities have systematically been planned and built with standards that reinforce a multitude of gender and social inequities and we're here to acknowledge the need for community development that allows women and children to access the spaces that they need for education, employment, and stable housing. And as I look at this space and think about the over 40 plus people that we have, you know, together here, educators, developers, caregivers, and elected officials, we're all here in this room because we're curious about what role we can play in solving the child care crisis. We acknowledge that it's not up to one of us, it's up to all of us. We've all heard the phrase that it takes a village to raise a child, so let's embody that here in Santa Clara County and beyond. Let's all be there for children, let's all be there for one another. And thank you again for taking um, 
the time to join us today. Thank you.